you hear me? Okay. Uh, so I, I thought I'd start off by just talking a little bit about um, why, why this issue I think carries uh, so much weight right now. Um, and I think probably it, it has something to do with the reason why a lot of you are here. Um, which is uh, there's been a lot of there's a little a lot of discussion about uh, economic inequality over the past couple of years as one of the largest and possibly most intractable issues that we as a country maybe we as a planet face, and it's often discussed in very sort of abstract, nebulous terms, uh, and and one of the things that got me interested in in writing and reporting about hunger and ultimately led me to Margaret is uh, that there's really nothing less abstract, nothing more visceral than not having enough food, uh, than, than being hungry. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not an abstract issue, it's not a, a faceless problem, but uh, those faces aren't ones that you see on the news very often. And uh, th that, I think, is part one of the reasons why the exhibit upstairs is called Hidden in Plain Sight. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about tonight, sort of who, uh, who is hungry <coughs> and, and why. Uh, but, but first off, uh, I understand that there are a few uh, member <laughs> pantries and yes. soup kitchens in the audience with us tonight. Is that right? Yes. I looked out and I saw some of our partners in the work. Um, and there's also people who work at Food Bank. Um, and so I really did want to start talking without first having them stand and have them be acknowledged. Because we really do this work as one net work. So if you... Uh, run or work at a soup kitchen, food pantry, shelter in partnership with Food Bank, please stand. Or if you are a food banker via employment, please stand. <laughs> Trying to hide over there. Uh, so, so first question, um, I think a, a lot of people don't really grasp the, uh, the severity of the, the problem right now. And without getting quite into the, the numbers of it, uh, I was wondering if you could just talk about, uh, from your perspective, how, you, how you've seen the, uh, the severity and the, uh, the extent of hunger in New York change over the past few years. Yeah. I think probably the greatest part of the severity of hunger is really its normalization. The fact that people are at a pantry while having a job. The fact that people are at a pantry or at a soup kitchen with their children looking for food for dinner. Um, I think that the number of seniors, people who have done their part to build this city, this country, and just because they are in a phase of life that we are, I mean, heck, I'm, it's each year I get older, I'm praying that I'm lucky enough to be a senior. It's a phase that we will hopefully all one day get to. But because they're in that phase and their incomes are now fixed or the dollars are fixed and the costs in the city are rising, it shouldn't be rising so fast, so high, that they are spending their golden years in a pantry. The fact that we are now being touted and congratulated because one of our newest programs is called a campus pantry, but that means we're having to bring food into the school. For me, I look at a program we just visited, um, Ned, it's in the South Bronx. And I'm proud of the work we're doing. There's a program called ISLA, and we're doing financial coaching. But before we got to all the financial coaching and all those kinds of things, the program started um, with the fact that we put a pantry there. Well, I finally got to go and visit the pantry. And my chief development officer, Lisa, told me to brace myself. You go in, and the school is beautiful, and the children are beautiful, and the space is clean, and we go into the pantry, and the food is plentiful, and it's organized. But it's in a room that's adjacent to the library. And there was more food than books. To me, that is the severity. 
I think when people start to just kind of believe that, well, it's the hungry, and you just receive that that's a part of life, versus it being they are New Yorkers living in one of the richest cities in the world, why is there not enough food? When we stop questioning that, to me, that is the severity. And it's, it's not okay. Um, when you talk about that idea of the hungry, yeah. um, there are certain ideas that people have about who is hungry and who isn't. Um, I, I committed a cardinal sin a couple weeks ago in journalism, which is I actually read the comments on one of the aye, articles. Um, you and, mean like the ones that say, Obama's my daddy? <laughs> I was like, really? Okay. Um, <laughs> But there was I don't a, get it. <laughs> but there was this one commenter who reflected that what I think is a, a, a pretty common sentiment where he talked about visiting a food pantry and seeing someone pick up food in a minivan. Yeah. And saying, obviously, this person has a minivan. How, how could this person be hungry? Mm -hmm. If they are hungry, why not just sell the minivan? Mm -hmm. Question, questions like that. And how, how do you respond to something like that? Well, did you look in the back of the minivan to see if maybe their clothes were there too? Um, do you know if the minivan is... Uh, part of where they go to work and maybe they d drop stuff off, deliver. Mm -hmm. The other part is hunger doesn't mean you shouldn't have anything. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know how many times a person has had to pay or to borrow money for gas for the minivan. Many of the people who are in line at a pantry is because the food is helping them to be able to pay the rent. The food is the thing that you can control. I've had, been in programs where I've heard a little boy tell me how his mom, he's like, last night, what did we have for dinner? We had some ice. Yeah. You've heard that as well. I have ice. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is a real thing that happens. I think a mom, I think a person would rather deal with the hunger pains than deal with being among the growing line and growing pool of New Yorkers who are homeless. Um, so I think that we, at the end of the day, it's more about why does no one question the rigors of poverty as much as we question those who are living with it and through it? Mm -hmm. It's a wonkiness in our thinking, mm -hmm. really. I mean, it's something that, it, because it's okay, we do it a lot now, where you blame the people who are dealing with something that none of us would want to. And that, that leads into another interesting question, which is that, that uh, hunger is one element of oh, this, yeah. this much bigger problem, which is poverty. Absolutely. And uh, uh, I understand that a lot of your, your food pantries and soup kitchens offer other services, too, yes. to, to deal with other elements of that problem. Mm -hmm. um, so what are some of the other huge needs that you're servicing in addition to getting people food? Yeah. I love how you set that up. Hunger is absolutely just a result of poverty. And food alone is wonderful. I mean, people need food and that's a thing that will make them come to a lot of these sites. However, the charities who are able to have a greater capacity absolutely understand and try their best to do more. Um, when you don't have enough food, you may not have enough clothes. You don't, one of the things that we hear the most is something many of us don't think about. The number one thing people request, diapers, uh, a lot of Programs who, are, who are have a lot of capacity, like uh, we're actually going to be in an article soon, Swami and I, uh, feminine care products. Uh, anything that's disposable and expensive is something that people who are struggling with food or to afford food is something that they need and something that they provide. Um, we are now doing taxes. I mean, something we were doing for years in the past year with the help of our member agencies, we returned $144 million in refunds back to the people who are on the soup kitchen and pantry lines. When I, anybody says, well, why are you guys doing taxes? Because a lot of the people on our lines have jobs mm -hmm. um, and they're eligible for certain tax credits. So we put resources towards ensuring that they get the money. Probably one of the best things I'm really proud that we do is that we make sure we also help them with getting food stamps. We do that because we're here to serve people, but 
We want everybody to have the same dignity that the rest of us have. We want people to shop in grocery stores, not in pantries. So the first line of defense for us is to make sure that whatever a New Yorker is eligible for, you know, we don't want you to be at a pantry when you're eligible to get some assistance as an American citizen. We want you to take care of those things and then as you have gaps in your needs that we help you with the other parts. But the, it, the list of services that our members provide could make your head spin. You're gonna hear more about that when I'm joined later uh, by Dr. Samuels, Swami Durgadas, and, um, our, and Monique Henry. Uh, so I don't wanna steal their thunder on some of the things that they're providing. Right. But I'll tell you one of the things I'm gonna say that Food Bank is now providing, which I think is probably one of the smartest thing and we consistently thank American Red Cross. During Hurricane Sandy, as you all know, there was money and questions. Money that was raised and then questions, how are we gonna spend it? Um, obviously there's that first line of like, get the food out, get the food out. But you have to come up with other solutions. And one of the things that we did, and I love it, is that we got American Red Cross to get us something that they wouldn't have thought that we would want, which was an RV. We actually asked for two of them. But we didn't ask for the RV for food bank. We asked for the RV so that we could better partner with our members. We wanted to be able to send some of our best to the neighborhoods that needed services the most. So we take care of the gas and the driver and all of those expenses. And then we put charities like bed Campaign Against Hunger, the River Fund, New York um, Common Pantry. We send them out to the places like Far Rockaway, the South Bronx, and they take all of the great services they provide from health navigation to help people get insurance, to helping them when they are in high risk situations, to helping them get food. Uh, fresh food, be able to shop in, in shop, we say shop, but to be able to client choice shopping in inside of the farm and the garden that Dr. Samuels has and get fresh food for their family. And all we had to do was buy an RV and we get to see these amazing connections happen all over the city, tying together greatest partners with the greatest need. I, I, can you tell I'm a little excited about that program? <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a little excited about that one. And I, I mean, you mentioned food stamps earlier. With, yeah. with all this work you're doing, um, and I mean, Food Bank for New York is is the largest charity of its kind mm -hmm. in the United States. Mm -hmm. When, uh, what do you make of this notion that uh, because there are organizations like yours doing this sort of work, there's less of a need for food stamps because charities can fill that need? Oi. <laughs> I say that's bananas. It's just it's just so untrue. Um, Get out of your mind that this work is done by charity alone. The number one resource of food that goes out comes from the federal government. It is a notion that really is actually a myth. We don't just provide whatnots to people. We serve them with dignity, which means they have to have food that you can make an actual meal with. You know, great when I get pasta but it's kind of good to have some sauce to go with it. You know, we, we try to make sure that it's comprehensive. And I can't serve people political jargon. Mm -hmm. you, well, you can, but you can't eat it. There you go. We try not to do that. We try not to do that. Um, but no, it's, it is just a myth. And I, it sounds good. I, I get it. I really do get it. I'm from the South. Nobody is more conservative than African Americans from the South. Trust me. And we'll find five scriptures from the Bible to back up, even if we made it up, <laughs> to back up whatever we think. But no, it is charity in partnership. I mean, even for our tax program, mm -hmm. yes, it's something that we do private fundraising for, but to get the exponential growth that I mentioned to you about the $144 million, for years, guys, Food Bank returned $65 million in refunds. We were proud of that. One partnership, one little bit of technology, we went from $65 million to $85 million. One partnership from the city of New York. Really? a couple of resources that we can put out there to the charities on the ground in the poorest neighborhoods, bam, 85 million to 144 million. 
So it's not so much about trying to prove charity can do, should do it alone. Why would we try when we can do so much better, faster, stronger when we work together in really strategic partnerships? That's the goal and the focus of our work. And so that's what we do. At, at the same time, there was this uh, relatively recent cut in food stamps. And, and oh, there have been some. It, it, it does seem that uh, uh, hunger has gotten significantly more severe from what you've been saying the past yeah. few years. Uh, you talked last year when I, when I spoke to you about the, uh, the new normal in hunger yeah. in New York. And I was wondering if you could uh, explain to our audience a little bit what that means. Well, for those who are unaware, there was a huge cut to food stamps. And what it meant in our city, this one city alone, is really why it's important that New Yorkers, who are some of the smartest human beings on the planet, when we hear things like Farm Bill, what we realize is everybody thought it was something in Kansas. And what we didn't understand was Farm Bill was one of the most urban-focused, high city, a.k.a. New York City-focused bills ever. And what it did was it stripped from the city, 5.3 million meals per month. Uh-huh. That is more than what we put out as, you know, the charity that everybody calls the most robust food bank in the world. Yeah, one decision stripped that amount of food. So the first part of the new normal is rationing. You know, there's a number that my soup kitchens and pantries, who, by the way, are run by people, who made a decision to serve the community. They're there to serve, and they do it every day, and now they're having to do it with much less and having to intentionally give people less than they know that they really need just so they can stretch it. Is that making sense? So that's the first part. Rash, I mean, rationing became normalized. When we now look at it, and thank goodness, we were very lucky for a couple of things that happened. You know, I know everybody has their different issues with all of our different elected officials, and you're absolutely right for every issue you have. But one bit of really good news we got was that our governor made an important decision. We would have lost more than those meals, everybody, if he didn't stop what they were all calling a loophole. A loophole. That loophole would have been a black hole. Still 5.3 million, but we were able to make some, some, we were able to make some changes that were still positive. The second thing that happened is that our state government actually came in with some new funds, and we got some different support from the city, account, city council, but what y'all should know, the things that we received, they were one-time pieces. So it really did allow us to kind of stretch our bodies across a lot of the loss that we had. The loss is still huge, and we don't have a clue what we're going to do for this upcoming year. But that did give us a little bit of cushion. And it really demonstrated, Ned, what happens when just even the smallest of resources are given to these charities on the ground. They know their neighborhood. They know the people on the line. They know where the need is. Let them go. Get them the resources so they can get it to the doggone people who need the food. Nobody is lining up at a soup kitchen and pantry, dragging their babies to a soup kitchen. Let me tell you, I got a soup kitchen in Harlem. I love my program and I love my members, but I thank God every day that not a single person who looks like me or has the last name Purvis has to eat their dinner at the site that I put a lot of care into. There's no way to shine up a soup kitchen experience. You just can't. No matter how much love we put in it, there has to be a level of just offense to the fact that it even has to exist. And that's not to offend any of my members, because y'all know I know that you're doing a wonderful job. But there is an ick that we're on a deep place. We are ignoring or not feeling or not recognizing, but need to get to. Because without the ick, there is no reason to make a change. You understand what I mean? Okay, sorry. Go ahead. And it seemed, it seemed I didn't mean to go on that tangent. <laughs> sorry, I, I forgot the doggone question. You know, it seems like there's a little <laughs> bit of a disconnect there, actually. Because, yeah. I mean, um, uh, obviously a, a lot of people showed up for this panel. Yeah. And uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, interest and outrage in, in hunger whenever... Uh, 
uh, the media actually writes about it. Uh -huh. But um, for whatever reason, there's this there's this absence of the of the issue when when you hear elected officials talk about inequality, or or most of the time when when cable news talks Absolutely. about inequality. Why is that? Really? <laughs> well, I mean, some things are about bias. Some things are about just a lack of education. Um, there's a lot of safety in them. As long as I can separate you from me, I can feel a little less. I can justify things. That's why I don't like to use the term the hungry, those people. They're just New Yorkers. And let me tell you something. We serve in 1.5 million New Yorkers. That's one out of every five New Yorkers. Trust and believe everybody in this room knows somebody we're serving. So I always tell people, be careful what you say. Because you don't know if the they you're talking about is your good friend who you work with. Your good church member. Someone who goes to your temple. We did, and Triada helped me with this number for Passover this past year. How many... 5.6 million meals for this past Passover. And nobody knows those people? Nobody. Nobody. When poverty impacts your ability to experience and practice your faith, that really should concern everybody. It, it really should. So that's what I think it is. I think it's lots, a lot of times, I'm, and I, I like to be positive and believe that it's more about people just really don't understand. Because I don't think we live in a world of meanies. I really don't. I think that we probably live more in a world of people who are just unaware. Really. I mean, I work at a food bank. I should be aware of some things. You don't, and I can understand why you wouldn't. But I think it's important about what happens, really, once you do learn. Once you do get an inkling. There actually is a lady who works at my, at my salon. And, that's, and I want to say that just because, even as the food bank lady, I'm in my pantry, and I turn the corner, and I'm like, oh, God, that's Esmeralda. And guess what? I panicked. <laughs> I know. I know all these people, from the senior center to our soup kitchen to the pantry, and I saw Esmeralda, and I stopped. Like I didn't know to go to the right or the left. I didn't want her to feel uncomfortable. I didn't want her to not come back because she realized what I do, because we just talk about, do you want the purple roller or the gray roller? I felt a little guilt, or like, am I not giving enough of a tip? I mean, what? I mean, these are really all the things that went through my head. And I'm sharing it with you to say, guilt has no value. It has no value. If you don't, no, or if you don't feel like maybe I'm not doing enough, let that be the starting point. Don't send a text and put SMH. That has no value either. Seriously. It's about finding the thing that has value and has value for you. Whether or not you go and work at a soup kitchen is not as important as if you just raise your voice. And maybe your job is to call an elected official, write a letter to see, hey, by the way, I live in bed -Stuy. Elected official person. Do you support bed campaign against hunger as my elected official? Because that matters to me. It can be those simple things like that that all of us can do, and we can do it easily. We don't have to pick up the phone. We can send an email. And on that note, let's actually uh, bring up some of yes. our, our food pantry uh, folks here. Uh, why don't you guys come You up? know we're talking to you three. <laughs> <laughs> I know that this was called a conversation with me, but guess what? The most interesting conversations you're ever going to hear in this work are with the people who actually run soup kitchens and food pantries. So we're really excited to be joined uh, by these wonderful people yeah. here. So from, uh, so from right to left, we've got uh, Dr. Melanie Samuels of the bed Campaign Against Hunger uh, in, in, here in Brooklyn. And we have uh, Monique Henry of Bright Temple AME in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And then Swami Durga Das of the River Fund New York in Queens. Um, so I guess, uh, first off, I just, um, I mean, this is going to be open up into more of a conversation. But first of all, I wanted to 
ask each of you to just sort of talk a little bit about, um, just describe your food pantry for everyone and, and the, the population you serve, and, and also just uh, say how, how long you've been, in, uh, been working on these issues. Hi, everyone. Um, Melanie Samuels, the executive director and founder of the bed Campaign Against Hunger. We are located, thank you. <laughs> We're located right here in Brooklyn, um, bed of course, and um, we, are in a, we have been in existence for 17 years. We are a super pantry, but as you have heard from Margaret, again, thank you for inviting me, but um, you've heard from Margaret how much we do other from food. So Bedside Campaign Against Hunger, not only are we a super pantry, but we have an urban farm, approximately an acre of land, both in Queens and in Brooklyn. Um, we do SNAP, which you have heard um, so much about. We do SNAP, we do affordable health insurance, we do clothing, we give, up, give out about a thousand pieces of new clothing to families, and when there are cases such as a fire, we're able to give families um, sheets and, and all the little necessities needed to get them up and running again. We also do um, Fresh Air Fund, we have internship programs for youths, and um, we have special programs where we stress a lot on health because where we are located, 23% of those that we serve suffer from di diabetes and we have a larger number that suffers from obesity. We also have with us our mobile pantry and our mobile goes into high needs areas, specific areas, not just because we wanna go but because we have to go. And so we are in Far Rockaway, we are in Coney Island and we are in the South Bronx. And um, I'll move on and I'll let money. <laughs> Hi, good evening. I'm Monique Henry. Um, I am the coordinator and administrator of the Bright Temple Pantry, um, located in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx. Um, we have been in partnership. Well, thank you first for allowing me to be here. Um, we have been in partnership with Food Bank since um, I would say last year, uh, 2014. Um, starting reopening the pantry in June of 2015. Uh, when we started, we had 70 families, um, and current to date, we have 259 families that we are serving weekly. Um, and we. Can, I want to make sure that they understand something about your service, Monique. Um, the site that she has, you guys, it's in the Hunts Point section of the South Bronx. That actually is the neighborhood, not just not only the neighborhood of Food Bank where our warehouse is. Hunts Point is where majority of all of our food comes from. However, if you happen to live in Hunts Point and the area is quite impoverished, there was not any place for you to go and get food. It was about nine years had gone by, nine years where they closed. There was, no, there was nothing that was there. Um, so when she tells you these numbers, that she's been open now for six months, it's after years of there being nothing for those people living in Hunts Point. So we are yeah. so proud to have her on the panel yes. with us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Hunts Point is actually also one of the, known as one of the poorest communities um, in the city. Um, and we're serving folks out of our church, but we just have a really small pantry. Um, I'm not, we're not even really able to serve the entire community of Hunts Point, which is rather large. Um, so I'm happy to be able to help with serving the families and the community. And I'll pass it on to Swami. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Swami Durgadas. Thank you for having me first. And I want to thank everyone for coming and taking an interest. Uh, because we need your interest at the, at the issue. What I loved about the start of the conversation was about poverty, and because I think that's really what we're addressing. And uh, so we started uh, 25 years ago in my mom's house, who's long since gone, and now we operate at, in my house, which is a larger facility, and we run a, we don't consider ourselves a pantry, 
because we're a poverty frontline center because that's what we're dealing with. We're not dealing with just pantry. So we have a pantry service. We do about 50 to 70,000 pounds of food a week on site, mobily client choice. We have a benefit service uh, that we were guided through the food bank into doing SNAP and now we do WIC, we do a lot of other programs. And we do about 900 appointments a month. And uh, 25 years ago on Thanksgiving we started and when we opened our, so we dealt with HIV and AIDS, which was at that point wasn't called AIDS. Uh, it was called GRID and then before that had no name. And there were a group of people that we dealt with that were throwaway people. And we're somewhat at the same place right now. We're in a throwaway people. We can discard anyone who comes to us. And I guarantee you everyone sitting here is sitting when you go back on a train or a bus or however you go back, look at someone you're sitting next to. There's there probably people who, as Margaret said, come to our pantry. I think everything we do really directs its focus on the kids. Our last program is created a college where we feel like we deal with, we as a pantry deal with a shower, baby shower program, 15 moms every five weeks that we throw a baby shower. Party, all the supplies you need. All of them are on WIC. We get them all the necessary benefits, but they can't keep it together. Our second tier is a backpack program. We do some 2,500 backpacks and supplies throughout the year. And our last initiative has been where we started a GAP scholarship program. As I see a lot of young people, if you're in college, you know how expensive it is. If you're in poverty, you can't afford that five to seven to $2,000. A book is $300. If you're one of our high achieving kids, you can't, you don't have a shot. So none of what we talk about will ever be over until those children have an opportunity to move themselves. I get emotional and you'll see me probably get well up at many points. But not what our issue of poverty is not over until every child has an education that they have the ability to make a difference in their lives and their family lives. So I once again thank you uh, and I implore that all of you as we go along Feel, find a way that you can help out with this issue because we need your help as a group. You just mentioned something about normal. We, Ned was talking about, you know, we're talking about normalization or, you know, how we can talk about it. Interesting, you all heard him talking about baby showers. He's now throwing a baby shower uh, at what was supposed to be a pantry. I know you now have a program that's about birthdays. Right, right? And, and what it is is that so often, so often we believe that um, we take so much for granted. When you consider if a family cannot put a decent meal on their table, how does a birthday fit in? And too many kids in this society, in our community, have missed birthdays because of poverty. Because a family cannot afford to put a cake on the table or even a gift. And I'll tell you a story. We, um, we've been doing this for quite a few years and we give thousands of birthday bags every, um, every year. And there was a story that was brought to my attention by a staff that says there was a woman who finally got a job. And this woman, um, excited that she got an opportunity. No, she didn't get the job yet. She went, she's going for an interview. But did not have enough money to go for the interview. Mm. So she came back to the office and she said she was curled up in her bed crying because she had a son and, and it was like, I, I, I can't get what I need to do what I need to support my child. So her son walks in and he gives her $20. So she says, where did you get this from? He says, from my birthday bag. What happened was that some, a group volunteered to do birthday bags and someone slipped in a birthday card with $20 and it wow. happened to have land on wow. this child. The woman came back, she got her job, she's excited. So birthday bags are something that we do. Books, another thing on our shelf, um, use books. We have books for families. And that's one of the commodities that really, really leave the shelf. And so, so many little things that we take for granted um, is so needed in our community. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I know that story and it gets me every time. <laughs> I know that story. I was told when she first told me about it, how many Biggie Smalls, uh, any, no Biggie, no Biggie? <laughs> well, I'm a Biggie fan, and I remember a line from one of his classic tunes, uh, which is where he said, birthdays was the worst days, yes. now we sip champagne when we're thirsty. Yes. And so when she told me about this, she was like, you're not going to believe what's become like one of my most popular 
Pete's we've got to be able to program. She's like, Margaret, it's a cake box. It's some candles. It's a hat. It's in a bag. And I think I started crying then. I was like, that's genius. Um, <laughs> and I was thinking birthdays was the worst days. But, you know, I want to I also add, we, we also serve families that are in shelters. And many of these families don't have conventional ovens and stove, as some of us might think. And so one family got a birthday bag. And in getting so, she came back and she said she could not bake the cake that was there. But what she did, she made pancakes. Flipped it open, made pancakes for the kids, put candles on it that we provided. Mm -hmm. And they had a birthday. And you're telling me that poverty, it is right at our doorsteps. It is right in front of you. It's beside you in the train. It's Mm -hmm. probably, like Margaret says, in your office. It's the next person you're meeting. And so... Um, those things, these things, every, when we think of pantries, we say, okay, giving a food bag, but that's not it. When we think of pantries, we, we now, we have really changed all that. In 2008, 2009, we, I wanted to just f- fill a stomach. Here is a bag. Here is a bag. Hoodles and noodles. Whatever I could put in a bag because I don't have the funding. But what happened was I found out that I was destroying lives in the sense that we had families, that, as I mentioned, diabetes. We were giving them grapefruit juice because it's the cheapest juice to buy. Yeah. And we were seeing that they were saying they couldn't drink it. I couldn't eat it. There were too much salt. There was too much sugar. And so we had to change. So we have revamped pantries on a whole, we have revamped how we take care of our families. It's not only dignity, but we are making sure, and everyone has a right to a decent meal. Yeah. Why not? Why not the fresh fruits and vegetables? Why not the, the protein? Why it has to be always in a can? Why can't it be chicken? Why can't it be fish? And so pantries, we, we have invested a lot into pantries in, in, in serving families, and guess what? It costs a lot. It just as it costs you to make a meal, it costs us to provide a meal for families. And so much of it hinges, guys, on things that many people aren't thinking about. You know, sometimes I'll hear some of the donors, you know, and they'll say things like, why don't you get more of the pantries to distribute the da-da-da-da-da? They have, they have a whole long list. And then I come back with, why won't you pay for refrigerators? <laughs> because... <laughs> or give them a grant to pay for the bill associated with the refrigerator. We have found that the challenge is never to get people who just care about their community to do the things that are best for the community. The problem is when your network is primarily one that is faith-based and they are relying primarily on what they take in in the collection plate, but then their congregation is also struggling down goes the capacity and all the things that they really could do or want to do for their community. You know, Dr. Samuels, when I think about when we first met you, yes, because she had a beautiful building now, but it was a, wasn't the church basement at first? It was a very small space. That looks a heck of a lot. Yes, yes. <laughs> very small. Yeah, very, very small space. We, we, we had all volunteers and... Um, Every, I mean, every dollar still counts, but it was so difficult and the needs were growing. And when we realized that choice was an important part of families um, in 2008, 2009, choice was important to us and we shift over and we became the first um, super pantry in bed mm-hmm. that gave that choice. And I'll tell you, when we, we introduced the concept, many people said, this will never work. Look yeah. where you are. Look, look at where you are. Look at who you're serving. But if you serve people with dignity and re- respect, they will respect the place that they're in. And we're looking here at Brooklyn, and we know that bed we talk about gentrification. Some people don't want to talk about it. But the reality is a lot of the families have left some of these more popular um, affluent areas. And guess where they are? They're right where we are. They have moved up into that neighborhood but while moving, we have found that they ha- if you notice in, your na- in the neighborhood, in some neighborhoods, Ned, is that there are more um, storage centers, storage places mm. going up. Mm. Have you ever asked why? Why yes. is storage doing such a great business? Because families have left their three-bedroom homes, and they are now in a three-bedroom, of course, apartment, mm-hmm. but there's three families. And so the additional furniture has to be put away because they can't 
they can't do both. And so we are finding out that families are um, sleeping one bed and you have five in the room. One bed, four in the room, seven in the room. And so these are some of the things we have to address. And how do we best address it? By um, using the resources we have, and as small as it is, is to make sure we can offer food stamp, make sure we can do the clothing, make sure we can work with, with do the baby showers, do things that are, might, not, might sound trivial, but it's important because families want to live. And so um, we make sure we, we, we do the fresh air fund. We make sure that um, income tax, which, and I don't want to take up all the time, but, <laughs> but I'm saying when I think of a senior that walks into our place and say to us, um, I didn't have any food. I've been safe. I do a little babysitting. And we heard Margaret saying after they have invested in the community, do a little babysitting and they have a little money left and not enough to buy food. And when they sat with one of our counselors, they found out that their taxes could have been done here. She said, no. you mean you would do my taxes? And we said, yes, and for free. She said, can I go back and get my stuff and get my taxes done? These things are needed. When families are in need, we need to reinvest in the community. And so simple things like our taxes are one of the most vital things. Yeah. Monique, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you face these challenges as someone who is uh, just starting out with a food pantry in an area that's been uh, struggling with poverty for four years. Well, as, as uh, Dr. Samuels mentioned, um, it's, it's coincidental that we have a lot of shelters also um, in the Hunts Point uh, community. Um, I would believe it's about four shelters in a very small area. Um, and may I add that we are the only shelter, I mean, the only pantry mm -hmm. um, in Hunts Point. Um, I, I like the, the client choice. We have, our pantry is client choice, um, which is really a good way of Money providing. what that means. Oh, client choice is actually, um, as Dr. Samuel mentioned as well, we used to give bags of food. Um, client choice now is we allow the clients all the families to come in and choose what they want out of the selection that we have available for them. Um, we devise a system uh, to where we can give them the appropriate amount of food for their family size. Um, Hunts Point has a very high volume of large families um, as well as single households, single moms, um, and they have large families. Um, we do also serve seniors. Um, one thing that I noticed uh, when we first started the pantries, we have a, um, we have a senior citizen's home um, right across the street from the church. Uh, my pantry starts, the pantry starts at 10 o'clock. Um, it's from 10 to 12. And the line starts at 6 in the morning. Um, when I get there around 7.30, you know, to just make sure everything is intact, maybe 8 o'clock, make sure everything is together. Um, my volunteers, they'll start showing up. But when I get there, you know, I'm, I'm greeted with everyone that's, th that's outside already. And most of the ones that are there are the seniors. Um, they really need the additional um, food assistance. And it shows me that it really helps. You know, um, initially when we first started, it was hard for me to to factor how much food to order. Um, it seemed that every week we would run out of food. It didn't matter how much food I would order, we would run out. Um, until, of course, I devised a plan of registration. So <laughs> with the registration, I was able to um, get an a accurate number of how many families we're serving and how many um, family members um, they had in their family. So we can be able to provide the appropriate amount of food for these families. You know, in the beginning, people were just giving numbers. And I realized, you know, my, my volunteers are like, oh, I know her. She only has one. She only has one child. And she put that she had three, you know. And I'm like, well, we can't argue and at the end of the day, it's food. No one is taking food to throw it away. They're taking mm -hmm. the food because they need it, you know. So um, I didn't really make a big deal out of it. I just said, well, I need to find a solution for that problem. I don't want 
people take in more than they need. And then the person at the end of the line, they're really getting a minimal amount of food. Um, so You know what's so funny? I love what you were just talking about, taking us more than they need. It's so funny that it's typically the people who come to visit our sites or learning about our site, that's always one of the top questions. How do you know that they need it? Are you sure that they're not taking more green beans than they're, they're just doing? Mm, yeah. We hear it all the time, and it's funny. We actually, just this past Thanksgiving, I had... Um, we thought we were at the end. Everybody was exhausted. It was the day before Thanksgiving. And one of my team members just happened to make a comment about, oh, thank God we're done. I can't believe it. We actually have four turkeys left. We've now learned whenever we come up with a weird factoid, it's probably for a reason. But we're cleaning up the floors. I'm waiting for them so I can get on the road. And here comes a family at the door. I will admit that my fantastic manager, her first thing was, no, 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 we're done. (laughs) She'd been at it all day, so give her a break. Thank goodness the rest of us were there like, "Uh, we're a pantry. (laughs) Come on in. So they had a bunch of children and a dad, mom, and some kids. And we have four turkeys. So my team, we said, run down and, you know, grab them a turkey. We couldn't do the whole full shopping, but we knew that's what they were there for, they told us. Well, they came down, and they had the two turkeys. And they're like, you know what, here, go ahead, happy Thanksgiving. And the dad said, no, no, we'll take what we need. There's probably somebody else who can use that, and I I wouldn't want to do that. He had barely turned out the door. Here comes the second person. Mm -hmm. We didn't even say, I didn't even try to do my broken Spanish. Here you go. (laughs) Right as we're turning to each other, and we see another person walking, but then my team member turns to me, and this is even the bias of those of us working in this space. Woman walks by, and he looks at her and said, he was like, oh, no, 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 she's not her. Oh, thank God we can get out of here now. Well, he said that because she was a white woman. That's why he said it. She came to the door, looking over her shoulder, and looked at me and said, My family's coming. I can't let them see that I don't have anything. Whatever you have, I'll take it. Number three. Mm. At this point, as we're about to leave, I said, just bring up the fourth turkey. (laughs) (laughs) Because lo and behold, here comes a woman running down with her cart. Running. Stop, 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 stop. Don't trip, don't do anything. Here you go. We got kisses and sugar and blessings and everything. (laughs) We see that kind of thing all the time. What I have found is more more than likely, those with the least are typically the most generous Mm -hmm. because they know what it means to be without. They know what it means. Because you guys got to remember something. Hunger in New York City, this is a densely populated city. When people get in our lines and they, they're sitting in a line in front of Mogenik's place for four hours, everybody saw. You cannot ever forget that your church members saw. Your baby's best friend's mama saw you in line, has talked you up a storm, told everybody what kind of lousy parent you are. Trust me, if they could avoid that line, they would. Mm -hmm. Because you can't hide it. We don't have a lot of space. This is still New York City. I don't have a back alley that I can hide the people on the line. At 116th Street and Frederick Douglass, which is where my soup kitchen is, everybody sees whether they're going to the laundromat, the senior program, the post office, um, the Kennedy fried chicken. Mm -hmm. They see you standing there. So we'll see people with the hoods. We see them with the earplugs. We see them turning towards a building. This is, this is the new normal. This is what we see all the time. Mm -hmm. So I really don't think that the issue uh, for the majority of the people who are on the lines or those folks who are served, I don't think that it's taking too much. We even saw, I actually saw this a lot years ago, Dr. Samuels, it was at your site. One of the fastest growing groups that we're serving everybody would be Asian Americans, uh, specifically senior Chinese Americans. 
Um, and part of the struggle we've been talking about now for a couple of years is the fact there's a huge, there, there is still language barrier in the sense that many of the charities are run by women who are African American, West Indian American. They don't speak a lot of Mandarin. Yeah. So when we talk about client choice, you see here both of them are saying client choice. Part of the reason why we push client choice is because it allows us to better serve a more diversified pool. Because remember years ago when you were telling me about how they were taking out the cans? Right. Because they only wanted the fresh vegetables. And some of our members were like offended, like, well, why aren't they taking the stuff I give them? Because they don't want a can full of sodium. Uh, That's not their diet. They wanted the fresh vegetables. They're not going to eat those pieces. You seen that? Right. And l let me add also where the question was, uh, do they really need? One of the things we do at Bedside Campaign Against Hunger, we serve 30,000, approximately 30,000 individuals per month. Wow. We have a database system. Once a family comes in, they spend at least 20 minutes with us where we do the needs analysis, where we look at the situation, what is going on. So usually when a family leaves us, they get what, um, they, what we can afford to give them, but also based on what we have worked with a nutritionist and we've worked with the city and we've worked with food bank. And so we, we do have a tailored um, uh, menu per se, shopping list, per se. So families have the ability to make choices. And I also want to add, when you hear families are there out there for four hours, it doesn't matter what the weather is. If it's snowing, we are so gracious right now. It's been so good in New York City. But normally, normally we're having rain, snow, sleet. Families are still standing there because they cannot afford to lose their space mm -hmm. in line. And that's important. And one of the reasons why we open five days a week and we stay open late is because um, years ago when we opened twice and for a window of two, three hours, it became very aggressive. Families were just antsy because they didn't know what was gonna run out and when it was gonna yes. run out and they were afraid of not having enough. Now, we still don't have enough, but, but that makes us ration what we have mm -hmm. so that everyone on the line can get. Yeah. Doc, um, Swami, now your program is featured upstairs in the exhibit. How many people do you all serve? Uh, weekly, we have, we're open six days a week, so no one's ever turned away, but on uh, our Saturday program, we serve uh, towards 800 families uh, a week. And that, you know, when we were addressing the families, the size of a family, I think four years ago, was 1.4 or 1.3 or something like that. It's now 2. Point, I think it's 7, because what happens is you no longer have a family with a husband and wife and your kids. You have your grandmother, you have your grandfather, you have a cousin, you have an aunt. So the households are now much larger that you're dealing with. It's not unusual for us to get, we have a, you know, a, a rather robust data system that really tracks all this stuff because we want to know what's going on. We have a catchphrase called taking poverty personally. We do want it. We do. I take, I see, when he started a pantry, I think we should all be offended I think somewhere New Yorkers should be offended that we have to start another pantry in one of our boroughs. I think it's, it's obscene nearly, so that'll get there on another 10, but it is that we have to keep on, that we go on like this. So we, we have, you know, we started talking about um, what we call a grandma, Chinese American. She's, I think, 80-something, comes to her line and said, you know what, can we help you? We'll bring you the food. She goes, no, I don't want it. This several years ago. And she finally came to us and said, you know, I can't come anymore. And so we started a home delivery program mm -hmm. that we, ha we started at five. We're at 50 and 16, we're going up to 200 uh, individuals or families. And that ranges from anything, someone facing cancer, they can't. So we don't just let them go bring them a bag of food or something. We want to provide independence. We want to provide that you have accessoride, that you have an aid. How do you get that when you're a senior and can't get to an HRA office? Or even when you get, and no offense to HRA, they were just on it, or whatever system it is, that you have to go upstairs that you can't get up. I mean, I think it's paying attention to each other and really being present. And you know, we're talking about a thousand partners, a thousand agencies within this city. That's amazing that a thousand agencies on all different levels of service are out here doing this work. Grateful, you know, it's our passion. 
I'll do, you know what? I said it last time. I said, you know, I'm a hawker and a schlepper. I'm going to hawk you for something. I'm going to schlep it somewhere. I have to go get, to, I have to do this. So it's part of my fiber. It's part of my training. It's part of everything. I have to do this. And everyone sitting there is, has passion to do this because there are not great rewards. We have staff members. Four years ago, we volunteer. We have 17 staff members. And I tell everyone who comes to us, if you think you're going to get rich here, you're in the wrong place. This is not the place you're going to get rich from. But we want, as, as Reverend Samuel said, we want dignity and respect on both sides of the line. There's no difference in the line to us. It's the same thing. If you face it, I face it. Why are we as an agency bringing in six to ten domestic violence cases a month? A woman came in the other day, a black eye. And I thought, I know you. Who, you know what's happening here? A black guy, her husband's beating her. He threatened her with a knife. We have to get her out of that situation. We're a pantry. We did get her placed. When they get released, like Reverend Sam was saying, how do we have to start a, a program that allows women who come to us and have no supplies? Margaret, Margaret said the other, before about a, a feminine product, so they were asking me. I mean, it's okay. I'm, <laughs> I'll lend voice to anything. I'm a hawker and I'm a schlepper. I want feminine product. So we, we got a palette about four months ago of feminine product. It went within probably if a half hour was a long time. So I was talking to the reporter and she said, well, she goes, well, what do you do? And I said, well, it's, we did it three months ago. And she said, so there was a pause. I was waiting for her to answer. I said, you know this better than I. This is not something that happens every three months. And we have, and we have young, and, well, and she laughed and says, touche. And, but we have parents who are coming in who now have their daughters. Where do you get this? When we were talking about food insufficiency, so there is a gap, there is meal loss here. There are kids going hungry. There are seniors who in all of our programs, the three highest demands for us are formula, formula, diapers, and guess what the third is? Pet, pet. No, and no. depends, I right, will say four. <laughs> depends, you know what else? Pet, pet food. food. Why? Yeah. Pet food, because seniors, that's their baby. Yeah. That's their company. Yeah. That's yeah. something that gives them something. So we have to go hawk pet food now. We're doing pretty good. We're trying to make new partners out there. But it's hard because the product, you know, it's out there and you just have to find the partners who Don't want Don't you remember when we used to have we a used lot to. of it? Yeah, yeah. Especially. And I think people heard about his hawking and schlepping. And now we can't keep the dog food. We yeah. can't keep it on the shelves. Back in the day, Ned, I mean, we could honestly, like looking at the code date on the dog food. Yep. That's no longer the case. During the recession, a kind of little dirty secret that people never talk about is that that was in our country the highest, highest number of dogs or pets being put to sleep. And the reason was because of economics, mm -hmm. that people couldn't afford to care for the pet. So we ended up making some great partnerships, but we now cannot keep it on the ship. Shelf. If there's not enough food for the family, the dog's in the family. There's not enough food for the dog either. Um, and people will line up. I know I've seen them at your site. Yeah. They will stay in line just as long for food for the pet as they will for themselves. Because it's that much of a need. To go on to one point about the line. So last, about two weeks ago, our staff left. They left like five, six o'clock, something like that. And they came back and they said... You know, there are people outside. We serve at 7 in the morning the next day. And as, as Reverend Sam, the weather is nice right now. Mm -hmm. This is in the cold. This is in the rain. You have seniors and families and moms. We don't, I don't want to do it this way. That's actually probably one of the more horrifying things that we have to put up with. So uh, it's, it, there's a... You know, I employ every, I see a lot of young faces. So we've, we're talking about seniors. I'm one of them at this point, you know, and that the need. But you're, there are a lot of youth here. We need your help. We need you to volunteer. You know, we were talking about hidden in plain sight, that Joey did a brilliant job of coming to us, not only coming to see what the issues were, but then traveling to the families to see how they were addressed, to see what they go home with, to see how they walk through all this. So if you have a moment and haven't seen it, I really implore you to go yeah, upstairs. And watch upstairs. it. It's a brilliant. It was a brilliant job done on bringing light to an issue within our city. Yeah. Please don't come here and not go and see that exhibit. Um, it's not just the, the beautiful, beautifully done pieces that are on the walls, but she also tells a story. There's kiosks that are in the middle, and you really get to hear the voices um, of the people 
who not only who we serve, but that who we serve with. Um, and Joey spent was it three years in the field. Um, this is just a regular New Yorker who showed up to help us, and she helped us with her lens, and she helped us give a glimpse that we needed to be able to show, and I think all of you really need to be able to see. So I hope you will go upstairs. And we're going to, I think, start wrapping up because he oh, told yeah. me to um, stop. We wanted to reserve a little time for, uh, for audience questions if uh, anyone has anything to ask for our panelists. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Charlene Mitchell. I'm honored to be here today, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, so you did mention there's a lot of youth in the audience, and I'm one of the youth. Mm -hmm. um, and what would somebody do if they want to be part of the fight, if they want to start a soup kitchen or a pantry? What would, what would you suggest be the first step? I would say the first step is to show up. Right. Um, show up and be open to learn and to be helpful. Um, that may sound really basic um, or simple, or it's not. You know, sometimes people come in and they want to have experience that they see in their heads mm -hmm. um, without really taking into account the experience that's needed. You know, I, for parents in the room, and I get this all the time, and I get it, we love our kids, we love them so much, we could eat them, we love them so much. But we're not helping them when... Either we're not showing them that service is important through our own actions or encouraging them to show up for others, to not try to get involved and try to craft the experience and, well, I don't want him to do this and I don't want him to do that. I'm not sure he's ready for this. Show up. Your life will be changed. The career that I have now, how, how old are you? 26. We're not that much of a youth. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you, you look good, but you know, millennial, but well, I owe my career, honest to God, to the time spent at my grandmother's feet. My grandmother took being a missionary Baptist seriously, and you weren't going to lay up in her house and eat her food and not go out with her. When she served, you were going to serve too. But I learned a career from that. My mother's a journalist. I learned from my mom that, okay, I want to serve, but I was also very clear. I want to serve the poor. I don't really want to be one. And I was clear about that at seven. Mm. My mother was a journalist, and she always would tell me, everyone has a story. You've got yeah. to have the humility to hear it, yes. yeah. to believe that it's important, and to have the sense God gave you to know when to say it. And the service combined with Understanding storytelling became a career, but you gotta first show up. And everybody, doesn't mean you gotta show up and now you're on the board. Mm -hmm. Show up and you're gonna revolutionize this soup kitchen game. Don't do that. <clears throat> just show up and let them know that you're serious. You're not just gonna come because it's Thanksgiving and Thanksgiving That's volunteering is great. <laughs> but they're there 300. And, I mean, they're there all the time. Show up, show up regularly, and even if you can't show up, just be helpful. Sometimes they don't even need another hand there. If I hear Dr. Sam Mills, I go, one more time say, gosh, somebody who can write. Can somebody just help me with writing a few thank you letters? Can somebody just do a little research on Google for me? Just It's the things that we take for granted mm -hmm. that you are probably doing right here with mm -hmm. your thumbs that you could get, gather, cut, paste, and send to her it would make a huge difference. It would. Yeah. It would. Yeah. It would. Yeah. It would. No, no, I'm saying it's it would. True. <laughs> you would have, well, no. I wanted to add, um, just you speaking on show up, um, we've actually started partnering with um, the local high school. It's a high charter school, um, and it's in Hunts Point, and I've worked with them to allow the students to come in to assist us. Um, and the students, they, they really get excited about coming, I'm sure because they don't have to go to school. But when, <laughs> you know, when they get in, when they get there, the experience that they get, it really humbles them. Yeah. You know, they, a lot of times, this, well, this younger generation, they take a lot of things for granted. Um, and getting food on the table, they don't really know how hard parents struggle to get food on the table. 
Um, so when they come and they are working and, and helping to, you know, pass out yeah. or assist, um, what I have them actually doing is assisting our seniors. Mm -hmm. um, we have seniors. I have a separate line for seniors and disabled um, folks, families. Mm -hmm. um, so instead of having them come downstairs in the basement where the food is, I'll have the students mm -hmm. go and take down exactly what they want, and then they'll go downstairs and bag up the items and give it to the students. So mm -hmm. I've learned that the students really enjoy doing that, and it humbles them. And you know something else? I want to, because there's an energy from Ned that's pulling me that says, <laughs> i got to say something. You also want to use your access. And if there are other reporters here, I'm not trying to offend you, but there's really only one Ned Resnikoff. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you why. No, seriously. Tell us. I remember the first time I in, that he interviewed me, and I got off that phone thinking, I think I sounded nuts. <laughs> <laughs> because we were in the heart. Now, you, as you all can see, we are passionate about this thing. And sometimes our passion could probably roll into Cuckooville a little bit. But I really hung up. I think I even called my board chair who's in the back there, and I'm like, oh, God. I had an interview with MSNBC. I don't know how it went. And he's like, well, Calm down. What did you say? I said, everything. <laughs> <laughs> but Ned is my example of what else you can do. And it is whatever platform you have, use it. Mm. He could have written the same old blase something that all the other reporters, they already have the answer. They already know what you're going to say. Even when you give a different answer, they're still trying to manipulate it and craft it into what they think you meant to say or should have said and all this kind of good stuff. That's not what he did. He actually did like this roundabout, just kind of let all of us tell our stories in our way and put it out there. And that story changed everything. Mm. It got us in front of people. It had donors of mine who never had any real desire to hear anything about SNAP. They were like, SNAP, what is SNAP? SNAP what? SNAP the finger snap? They had no clue about what that was. One of my donors actually called the elected official, uh-huh, a senator who he gave money to. He called her to task, made her come to New York City to explain, so tell me that decision you're making that's going to strip all these meals out of New York. That didn't happen because of me. This guy used his platform for people who he didn't even know. Everybody can do that, no matter what your platform is. It could be that you're the chief usher of the blah, blah, blah. You can use what you have. Someone says something that sounds pretty biased or kind of Mr. Righty Pants about people that they don't know. Well, you're now smarter because you sat here and learned from us today. You can use your voice and say, actually, that's not really true. And that can be your act of bravery on behalf of others. You get what I'm saying? All right. All right. I guess we should take another question. <laughs> Well, you would be a family of one. You would be in my tribe, a family, a family of, of one. one. Finger, yes. Every right. single step she takes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would be you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Yes, yes. And there are, and this, you know, look, Lady Liberty is our sign for a reason. There's a whole lot of gorgeous single women in the city. Amen. So, Amen. yeah, we have a lot, and a lot of them are seniors. So, <laughs> so we, we definitely count it as a family of one. That's a good question. Guy back there. Hi. Does this, this work? Yeah. Thank you very much for all your very great work. I'm also curious about, because a few of you have mentioned that it is obscene that we have this many pantries, and it's great that, we, that you <laughs> do all this work to help, uh, help these people, but how do we change that? You know, how do you stop the increasing need for pantries? Uh, do you work politically? Do you want us to work politically? Absolutely. Uh, the real change always first starts with policy. 
Um, you know, the one downside about New York is that, you know, we do have really pretty supportive leaders and pretty liberal, and then there's the rest of the country. Uh, so sometimes we can be out there on our own, but it's still important to push any way. Um, one thing I want to be clear about, you know, the thousand charities, when we talk about the obscenity, we really are just saying the shame of mm -hmm. want in a city that has so much. That's what we mean when we talk about the obscenity of it all. Um, but we are in no way um, taking away from the vital work that we are blessed every day to support. Um, you know, last year, Food Bank for New York City distributed 120 meals every minute. Wow. wow. Yes, it speaks to our prowess, but yeah, sometimes it makes your head spin. Wow. It's like 120, take that in, 120 free meals every minute last year is what went flying out of, out of our organization. So that's what we mean when we say that. So the first thing we want definitely is policy. We need better laws. We need greater access. You know, we are in a place now where the city of New York is partnering more and more with Food Bank and our member agencies where there's more opportunities for families to not have to leave work in order to get food stamps, because that's one of the things. If you are in a situation where you're not making enough money or you don't make the money that hits you know, the, your wages, you can't afford to not go to work, mm -hmm. to go to an appointment and then another appointment and then another appointment. So the fact that they now see members like River Fund and Bedside Campaign Against Hunger against, like, as viable partners, and we now can put those resources in neighborhoods so that when people go to get their food, they can also sign up for services. You know, when we talk about the number of people we serve, something that Swami actually put in my ear, can y'all see why I love my job? Like, I get to talk to these people all the time and get to sound like I know all kinds of things when I really just know them. Um, <laughs> but Swami made a comment. He was like, you know, Margaret, let's be clear about something. When I tell you I'm serving 20,000 people a month, it's not the same people. Mm. That is an important factoid, specifically because we don't want to get in a place of where we're forgetting that there are more and more people who fall into our system. There are lots that fall out, too. And we're very grateful about that. And sometimes I think when we talk about the 1.5 million New Yorkers, people imagine it's the same people day in, day out, year by year, and that's not the right. case. Our network is there for anyone whose life changes. I'm going to embarrass them just a little bit because I think this is important. You know, one of my board members who actually is a Brooklynite, I'm the CEO now, but I started as a vice president at Food Bank when I, too, was a youth. And <laughs> of 28. And, <laughs> and I remember that we were sitting in a meeting and one of my board members wrote me a note and said, can you name a couple of charities where if I just gave them you know, $5,000 that it could make a difference? And I said, yeah. Well, Dr. Samuels was one of those charities. She actually was in that church, base, church basement then. Yes. Go forward. Several years later, when I returned as CEO on my anniversary, first year anniversary, Hurricane Sandy hit. We could not get to many communities. We deliver food in tractor trailer trucks. Mm. All that 120 meals in a New York minute did mean nothing when we couldn't get to Far Rockaway. Guess what? She could. Mm. When we looked at the charities who were there, by the way, guys, for all of us, because a disaster levels a playing field. There are people who are in our lines who used to be donors. Who were donors before the storm. The storm put them online as well. And they were being served by groups that at one point have been in their church, ba church basement and were now having a major hero moment on behalf of all of the rest of us. So that's what I mean. I'm on a... Because they never get to hear that. <laughs> so it's all of those kinds of things. I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. But we need you to get involved. Because that was a very good question. I can tell when I'm talking to somebody really smart. So we really need you to get involved. And we don't have enough women to step up as board members of a lot of these charities. When hunger very much is a woman's issue. Mm -hmm. So I hope that you will take this 
and connect with a charity. You will be their greatest blessing of 2015 if you can make it happen in the next two weeks. Because <laughs> we need somebody besides, besides um, Swami to care about feminine care products. <laughs> And depends. And depends. It actually is a it's a huge yeah, issue. It's, it's a huge issue as well. Uh, so. I think we have time for a couple more. There was a man over there. I'd like to suggest that we need to be more proactive, mm -hmm. not just trying to address the immediate crisis or emergency. But I discovered something less than ten years ago, and I've been around for quite a few decades that I never learned about in college or anywhere else. To me, it's a cause and a solution, mm -hmm. and it's a solution which we're not allowed to learn. We're allowed to learn socialism, we're allowed to learn communism, because they're not real threats. Mm -hmm. But we're not allowed to learn, in any college I know of, the ideas of a man who got twice as many votes as Theodore Roosevelt, when they both ran for mayor of the city of New York. They were talked about here in a book talk of about, about a year ago. I, I'm, I'm Henry sorry, sir, George. Do, you have a, do you have a question yes, for the panelists? Yes, it's progress and poverty. I'd like to know how many of the people on the stage have ever heard of Henry George, who wrote the very popular book, Progress and Poverty, who ran for president, who got twice as many votes, as I said, as Theodore Roosevelt for mayor of the city, and whose ideas have been suppressed for the last 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. He taught and understood and wrote about classical economics, mm -hmm. where there was labor, capital, and land, mm -hmm. not just labor and capital. Mm -hmm. If we, he believed we, human beings have a right to live. Human beings require natural resources to live. Therefore, human beings have a right to natural resources. Somehow we got the idea it's okay for you to own the natural resources and charge all the rest of us to live, mm -hmm. to even have a space to stand or sit or lay down. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. That, the, the cost of all those natural resources. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Okay. I have not. I'm sorry. All right. One more question over there. Hello. I want to thank everyone for on a, everyone for coming, even you guys. <laughs> um, my question is: um, I do a lot of volunteer work. I actually volunteer for the New York Wine Food Festival uh, recently. Um, the other side of, I think, poverty is also that side hustle. And my question is, and I actually gave the same question to someone who worked for Fresh Direct, and he was like the, B, the VP. I wasn't very really happy with his response, but I'll leave it there. Um, with, the, with the food stamps in the 90s, a lot of people I knew because food stamps wasn't really feed, still feeding the family. And he had this side hustle going on which was you had your own little catering business on the side, your food catering. And you would use your food stamps to create your own little mini business. And a lot of people survived doing that. And I thought that kind of idea died out in the 90s and I'm realizing that it's still going on. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there is, you know, the tell of two cities as, you know, de Plasio says. There is the feeding people who are in need and then this other side of the food industry that is like booming you know, with um, new and inventive food. So my question is this. Being that, just in my life, and I'm, I'm older, I'm not young, is there, are there any programs that help out women who are trying to start their own food business? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Because I think this is very important. Absolutely, because yeah. I'm thinking like, food bank, you know, pantries, you guys have certified kitchens. You already know about the basics of running a kitchen that's certified so that you can make your food and things of that nature. There's programs out there where, like New York, I think like New York um, Tech and Kingsborough Community College that do have culinary programs that is tied into HRA 
which also have clients that are recipients of stamps. Mm. And they can't even get employment in the food industry, but have brilliant ideas. Yeah. And I'm one of the people who actually went into that training program. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be on SNAPS or public assistance. You just have to fit that impoverished pop population wow. to qualify to be in that program. Mm -hmm. So my, my, just two parts of my question. Is mm -hmm. there in the future any plans to create a program for underserved women or male mm -hmm. um, to create their own business, their own food business? And the second question is, are you pulling students or graduates from those culinary programs mm -hmm. into your programs mm -hmm. for like employment or opportunities. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, I think the first part, I just want to make sure everybody here knows. Um, the first, no, Food Bank does not have a plan at my organization to do a culinary training program. We had one actually in the past years ago and we decided to focus on the most strategic programs to lift people from poverty and that's why we do Food stamps, the taxes, the food distribution as like our core, our core business it actually was a strategic decision made by our board. However, many of our members provide all of those different kinds of programs and they face some of the same challenges about ensuring that there actually is a place for people to go for employment. As a network, what I think is kind of the biggest issue is we are now operating as a city with the lowest number of soup kitchens in our history. In our history, meaning it is harder now to find a hot meal within communities than it ever has been. It used to be that the soup kitchens made up about 25-30% of our network. It's now something like, I guess um, Kamisha's in here, I think it's uh, more like 15, about 15%. 15 Never has it been that low. Um, for a few reasons. Ch these charities, they're not pretending that they're struggling, they're struggling. So being able to just pay someone to cook who actually has culinary skills, not happen. If they know how to cook, they're going to go to a restaurant to get really paid mm -hmm. to cook. Um, the cost of entry into running a soup kitchen is so much higher than a pantry. So just being able to get that participation, it's easier for us to get a charity to say yes to a pantry than to say yes to a soup kitchen because they immediately start looking at the dollars needed to effectively run. I also want to make it real clear too that when looking at these programs, I hope that when you all walk out of here and when you hopefully go upstairs, you realize that this work is not, you know, while it's fueled by volunteers, it is not volunteerism. These are legitimate charities providing a consistent service. My soup kitchen managers and pantry managers, whatever, they honestly don't have time to do a side hustle because their main hustle is about to kill them. Mm -hmm. What we really need is that next generation to step up because one of the reasons why we haven't been able to replace a lot of programs that close is because the manager passes away because mostly seniors are running these programs yes. and no one else stepped up. And on that note, yeah. What could people in this audience walking away, what, what could they do tomorrow okay. if they wanted to? My uh, media person's over there, I can see her nodding, saying donate, advocate, volunteer. That's <laughs> always the thing that we're supposed to say. I think the very first thing, I mean, you've already shown the interest, now do something with that interest. To figure out where might you fit in, whether it is some zip code philanthropy where you go online, you can go to our website, put in your zip code to find a program that's near you. Because it's always great when you come to the big brands, but boy, is it awesome if you really knew if there was one right near your house, yeah. your apartment, and go there. Always great to work locally. A dollar to Food Bank for New York City will get you five meals. We're proud of that. But guess what? A dollar to these charities keep the, keeps the lights on. Pick one. <laughs> They're all great. You can show up by volunteering. As I mentioned before, you can use your voice. You can be like Joey O'Loughlin and turn your talents, your interests into a real commitment. Maybe you don't have three years to put in the field, but you can show up. Maybe you show up as a, as a board member. Maybe you show up as a thought partner. Because let me tell you something. When you are pained and thinking about the same issues and you get hit in the gut by things that just... You can't even tell the public. Like, there are things we cannot tell you about how <laughs> dirty this work can get sometimes. 
Your ears are too innocent and I want to leave them that way. <laughs> but boy, is it awesome when I have these great New Yorkers, some of them are my board members, my donors, who actually sit with me and help me think things through. They just give me a different perspective because they're not in it the way that I'm in it. You know, we actually, I, I hate to admit this, but with Joey O'Laughlin, the one who did, that, did the exhibit upstairs, do you know what we asked her for? We thought we just wanted some photos for marketing. We need new shots, new images, new whatever. Not even understanding really the power that, no, you need new stories. Mm. You need to show the new normal. So it's really, when I mentioned before, show up, that really is the easiest thing that you can do however, whatever your level is. Show up beyond the holidays. Let January shock the world. Mm. And you are interested in being a part of this work. February, March, April, May. MLK Day weekend is coming up. We have projects all over the city. Join us for one. She now can do more food because we were able to send volunteers to her um, garden in January. Right. Got a hoop house. Got a hoop house. Nice. I didn't even know what that was, but they built it and it was, apparently <laughs> was fantastic. Nice. Showing up, using whatever your platform, whatever your voice Use it. That really is the best thing that you can do for us, obviously, along with, again, showing up. Showing up. Uh, let's give our panelists a round of applause. <laughs>